All right, we're back here on Is It Prophecy on Israel National Radio, Root Sheva, and the show is syndicated as Messiah Hour on YouTube. Go to YouTube and type in Messiah Hour with Ari Lewis and subscribe to the YouTube channel. It is free to do so, and you can email me, of course, at messiahhour.gmail.com. We're continuing the conversation with author Jeremy Joss, who has written the book Dinosaur Derivatives and Other Trades. You can find that book, again, on dinosaurderivatives.com. Now, before the break, uh, we were talking about personal finance and people with their monies going up and down. I want to talk about countries. Uh, give I, I know this is a very broad question, but some people are in favor of President Obama's uh, economics, and some are not. They say the, un, the unemployment has decreased. They say the debt has increased. Talk yeah. a little bit about your, your thoughts about his presidency from an economic perspective. Okay, so look, I think that's a very interesting question. Again, my book is not necessarily trying to deal with specific practical uh, applications of, of, you know, what's going on today. But at the same time, I do comment a great deal on um, the point you just raised, which is, let us say, more left-wing economic policies versus right-wing economic policies. There's one, and I want to just touch on one of the story, another sort of wacky story in the book, which is um, a story about taxation and distributive justice. And what I try to do is, I, and I imagine the the, um, the ancient city of Atlantis, right? You know, the, the lost city of Atlantis, and I say, well, you know, what what might have been the political economics of that of that island? And um, just, you know, just to take a step back, I mean, that was a, you know, uh, a Greek city-state, which um, supposedly um, was run by these philosopher kings. And, and just to understand that, I mean, we need to just touch on Plato for a second, and we don't need to go into in, in a lot of detail. But Plato believed that the best way to run a, a state, and in those days, Greek city-states, was, was that they should be run by these sort of elite philosopher kings, which... You know, to me, is actually one of the most stupid ideas in philosophy because <laughs> because because we all know that academics don't necessarily make the great leaders. Although, having said that, um, I think unfortunately in today's society we've sort of taken it to the other extreme, and some of the most stupid people go into politics. Yeah. So, 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 so I'm not sure we've got the balance right either. But anyway, that that's a side point. The story is about this philosopher king running Atlantis who introduces the concept of to each according to its, their merit, right? And this is, this is an old concept of distributive justice and can inform taxation policy and it can inform your whole um, macroeconomic policy. Um, and one of the things, um, and it's a concept that's been analyzed by many uh, political economists over the years, but one of the things I try to point out is that that notion, to each according to its merit, under certain circumstances can be interpreted as very socialistic. But under other circumstances, it can be interpreted as, as very capitalistic. And ultimately, the story, I mean, uh, this philosopher can just sort of you know, drowns the whole island in his nutty ideas. But what I'm trying to bring out in that story, and, and, and I touched on this throughout the book, is that I no longer believe that either simple, you know, liberal socialist economic ideas or, or on the other hand, a simple capitalistic uh, a model works anymore for our modern nuanced political economy. Um, I think actually the whole concept of socialism capitalism was really a product of the industrial revolution i don't think that before the industrial revolution i don't think in renaissance times i don't think or, or certainly in med medieval times i don't think in ancient times uh, people really thought in terms of socialism and capitalism those, those were pr appropriate concepts for the industrial revolution we live today in a post-industrial environment and many of these ideas are, are simply out of date and and one of the problems we have, I think certainly in America, where you know I lived, I'm, I'm English originally, but I live in America, is we have these very entrenched views on economics that you know things must either fit a a socialistic model, or they must either fit a, a capitalistic model. Um, and so to your question about Obama, I want to encourage people to judge things on their merits, right? And different economic policies and different, um, I believe, social policies as well are appropriate for different circumstances. Um, as it happens, I believe the easy money policy of Ben Bernanke uh, over the last few years in America was very successful. Uh, and it was appropriate for America, for America, specifically for America, because America is an enormous economy, because it has a global reserve currency, and it sort of could afford to 
spend its way out of recession. But of course, that doesn't mean to say it's appropriate in other circumstances. In the UK, for example, where I came from, they ran much more of an austerity policy, which seems to have worked also. And, and I suspect had they run a loose monetary policy, it would have been a mistake. My answer to your question is, let's not judge these political and economic issues based on our entrenched ideologies. Economics is very complicated, it's very nuanced. The right economic medicine uh, differs depending on the particular circumstances. You know, some, sometimes a, a Keynesian, a more left-wing policy can work, sometimes a more capitalistic policy can work, uh, and, and that's one of the messages also of the book. Well, how about this? I know that we're going to have everyone listening, they have their own political bias, and right. but what I want to know is, you look at in America in the, the late 90s in particular, it was yeah. doing fantastic. Everyone was in the plus, if you will. They had houses and stocks and all that kind of stuff. People had different arguments if they were Republican or Democrat of who should get the credit. Democrats are going to give it to Bill Clinton. Republicans want to give it to Ronald Reagan from his policies in the right, 80s right. or so on. How much of that was non-political? How much of that was Alan Greenspan or Bill Gates or the companies that popped up, the, the dot-com boom, all that kind of stuff? Give us your take from the non-political perspective. Well, look, I think that's exactly right because, you know, part, you know and again, part of this is why economics is so nuanced because, you know, the political po policy only determines so much. I mean, stuff happens, right? All sorts of stuff happens uh, that governments have no control over, you know, such as the emergence of new technologies. Um, and I think, you know, I think Reaganism for its time – Actually, I happen to think did a great deal of good, and it and it and it revitalised the American economy at at that time. It also ultimately created a huge deficit problem, and was partly uh, and you know, you know and then ultimately through Alan Greenspan and and his policy of um, you know keeping interest rates very low was partly responsible for the crash. Um, you know, since then we've we've had a loose monetary policy, um, one which um, uh, some on the right haven't agreed with, uh, but it's also had pretty beneficial effects. I mean, let's be clear: today, America has totally transformed itself. I mean, it, it created the credit crisis, but it's now literally back on top. I mean, the dollar is going through the roof, uh, the uh, the um, inflation is low. Uh, unemployment is low, GDP growth is high, and, and to your point, one of the things that helped in all of this was a totally extraneous factor, namely the fracking revolution, right? The fracking revolution, which was developed by some American private on, entrepreneurs, has, has completely uh, has brought um, enormous amount of economic power to America. I think in 2015, America will now be the biggest oil, never mind gas, but oil producer in the world for the first time ever. Uh, that has broken the OPEC cartel, which is frankly very good for most of us Jews. Um, the OPEC car and cartel no longer functions, and indeed that's the reason why oil prices have collapsed. So, um, you know, to your point, uh, again, I think uh, government policy does matter. I think sometimes a capitalist, more cap a more right-wing policy is appropriate. Sometimes a more left-wing policy is appropriate. But at any rate, all sorts of other things are always happening. Uh, and we, when we tend to get surprised by these other things. I mean, to give you another little anecdotal story, uh, I believe in 1910 in England, in London, where I came from, people were very concerned that uh, they were absolutely convinced the horses everywhere and there was mud everywhere. And Every, and there was commentary that within about five years, London would literally sink under under the weight of the mud from the horses. Well, of course, what happened in the next five, ten years was the invention of the automobile. And so that within ten years, there wasn't any mud at all because everything had been concreted over, right? So, yes, all sorts of other stuff happens, uh, not – particularly driven by by government policy. Again, this is Is It Prophecy on Israel National Radio, Ruth Sheva, and the show is syndicated as Messiah Hour on YouTube. Go to YouTube and type in Messiah Hour with Ari Lewis and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Email me, messiahhour at gmail.com. And again, our guest this afternoon is Jeremy Joss, the author of the book Dinosaur, Derivatives, and Other Trades. Jeremy, let's talk about 
Europe because I've been told Europe is quote unquote bankrupt. What exactly yeah. does does that mean? Is that in its literal sense, or is that money will be coming to them later? And technically, as of now, they're bankrupt. Well, I think I think that the um, ongoing ongoing uh, um, relatively um, socialistic policies in parts of Europe, which have been sustained for a very long period of time, for example, in countries like France. Uh, uh, have become unsustainable. Uh, again, to my point, uh, you know, a, a, a interventionist policy is right at certain times, a non-interventionist policy is right at other times. But, you know, countries like France, a number of countries in Europe have simply stuck to this sort of dogmatic interventionist policy. And, you know, a country like France today uh, has had 10% unemployment for 40 years, has not balanced, balanced their bu budget for 40 years. Uh, uh, other countries in Europe uh, are just simply profligate, you know, such as some of the southern countries in Europe where, you know, in a Greece, people just don't pay taxes or when they borrow money, they just don't think they need to actually, re you know, repay their loans. So, so you have a number of, I think, um, cultural and social uh, attitudes towards economics which are entrenched and have been extremely unhelpful. The result is is a massive, massive uh, government deficit uh, problem. And of course, the, the real issue you have there is that you know, deficits can be managed if you can control your currency. But because the European, uh, the, the, Euro, the, uh, the, the Euro covers a range of different countries with different, very different macroeconomic situations, uh, it's extremely difficult to, to manage that currency in a way that's appropriate for all the members of the euro. So um, I, think that, um, I think that Europe has got these you know, unique set of problems, both in terms of you know, outdated economic models, uh, declining population, different levels of performance uh, between you know, some of the countries in the south, some, some of the countries in the north, a, a currency union that's just inappropriate for the number of countries that are within that union, um, uh, 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 and you know, declining population. Uh, and frankly, I, I will say, I think you know, you know, some of all of this has resulted in in uh, some of the the cultural and social issues in terms of Islamic fundamentalism um, uh, that's going on in Europe. So, so um, you, you've got this sort of poisonous mixture of, of features, uh, which uh, I think are going to be very, very difficult to break. Now, one of the economies I'd like to bring up, since I live in the country, is Israel. And about a year and a half ago, I went to a financial seminar. And the man leading the seminar said something shocking to me. He said, believe it or not, Israel is one of three countries that's considered to have a stable economy in the whole world, which I found right. a little strange because apparently 70% of people living in Israel are in the minus in a minimum. So right. what is the story with Israel's economy? Because people in the country can't really explain it to me. So you're the expert. Yeah. You, you can explain it to us. Well, look, and again, I, I want to be careful because my book, as I say, is more sort of slightly – Alice in Wonderland and absurdist when it comes to some of these economic issues, and I don't want to, and I'm not trying to give, you know, prescription, prescriptive answers to particular uh, macroeconomic situations in particular countries. But, you know, I have done a whole bunch of work in Israel, and I've worked for, for the Israeli government in, in, in my career, uh, and I, I, think, I think what's happened in Israel is, um, you know, Israel came from a, a socialist Zionist environment and I think that actually you know and, and to be clear it was a very very there was nothing there when when, when the state was first founded uh, and that was probably a, you know a reasonable model for the for the the early days but but I think that the country did well to break down a lot of that that uh, socialist infrastructure and and, and liberalize the economy um, but when you do that uh, when you do that, what happens is you get a lot of economic growth, and the Israelis are great entrepreneurial people. As we all know, they've exploited the technology sector in, a, in an absolutely unique way, uh, and are some of the leaders in the world. But w when you have that liberalization of the economy, when you have that sudden growth, which we've seen in Israel, what tends to happen is that the wealth goes, at least initially, to a small part of the population. And again, this comes back to my point where – to say that you know 
don't believe that either capitalism or socialism is the right answer. You know, you, you need to liberalize economy for it to grow, and that is what's happened in, 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 in Israel. But initially, as economies really explode, a lot of that wealth tends to go to a, a small coterie of people who are in the right place at the right Time. And indeed, that's what's happened. Well, that is what happened in America in the 1920s, right? You know, most of the, the the extraordinary growth in the American economy then went to a small number of very, very rich families. Now, I do believe over time there's what's called the trickle down effect, which is that, which is that you know that wealth slowly does get spread. But but let's be clear, the trickle down effect happens often very, very slowly. It can take decades and decades for that trickle-down effect to happen. So what I think you're experiencing among many people in Israel is a fundamentally growing, dynamically growing economy, but much of that wealth is going to a small part of the population, and therefore your average guy and even your average professional is saying, hey, I'm just, you know, I'm just missing out on the whole game. Indeed, I'm suffering because prices are inflating, uh, 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 and this is very hard. Um, uh, as I said, that is one of the that is one of the side effects of of rapid capitalistic growth. Uh, over, and 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 over time, one can hope that will level itself out. But again, it'll only level itself out if capitalism is moderated with some element of redistribution, some element of support for you know those people who aren't benefiting uh, from 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 the economic growth. So I think that's what's going on. So, would your advice? If that makes sense. No, it definitely makes sense. So let's say you have a guy that's making six, seven thousand shekels a month, which is considered very pretty good actually. Uh, although right. they could barely pay their bills with that amount, especially if they have, they have right. a family. So, right. is your advice that it would take a long time for the very rich people to trickle down their money to, let's say, somehow work with the American economy since that's doing well right now? Like, how would you advise the the average Israeli living here? Um. Uh, look, I think the trick. I think I think the problem with what was called, you know, Reagan called trickle down economics is that it. I believe in it, but it takes a very long time. It can take, sometimes take a century. I mean, look, let's let's be clear. Anybody in the Western world today is virtually everybody is wealthier and has a better standard of living than the average person in the Western world in the middle of the 19th century. Okay, sure. um, and that was because of industrial and capitalistic growth. But but during the 19th century, a lot of People, poorer people, uh, you know, the non-bourgeoisie, had lived in terrible conditions, awful conditions, right? So it took, it takes a long time for that trickle-down effect to function, um, and it could take decades and decades in Israel. So it, you know, if you're the average guy in Israel, you know, you can't wait for that, right? right. Um, you, you're not going to be able to wait for that. I think that. I think that you have to look. Well, the knowledge economy is everything today, and this is, you know, when I was getting back to saying these old ideas of socialism and capitalism don't necessarily work. Those, those are really ideas of, of an industrial society. We live in a knowledge and service-based economy today. You, you know, if you if you want to benefit from the growth, you need to focus on those sectors, right? You really need to, to focus on on the knowledge economy. That's where the wealth is going to. Um, that's the first thing I would say. I, I, I would also say that, um, uh, you know, you, you asked in terms of who to trade with. Well, you know, I think America is back uh, in the game, and obviously Israel has good connections with America, but, but there's no doubt that there are other global powers r rising big time, China, India. Uh, that's nothing original to say that. And, and I think Israel can can exploit its geographical position uh, very effectively. And I, and I think actually, you know, particularly Indians have had some of the same cultural experiences uh, as Israel has had, um, uh, you know, with some of the uh, sort of Muslim communities over, over the centuries. And, you know, I, w I would certainly encourage um, Israelis to look eastward as well as westward, and I know many of them are. So mm. that's just a few anecdotal points. Sounds like some good advice there. Again, uh, my guest this afternoon is Jeremy Joss, the author of the new book, Dinosaur Derivatives and Other Trades. And, Jeremy, I wanted to ask you a personal question. Obviously, this is your expertise. This is something you're passionate about. How did you get into finance and economics? Because this is clearly something that uh, you are really, really into. So tell us how you got into it. Well, look, the reality is I actually st – I mean, I studied at Oxford University and then I, in London and I studied as a graduate, uh, and, I, and I studied a lot of – not just economics, but philosophy as well, I, uh, both. In fact, 
as a young student, I was more taken by the philosophy than the economics, to the point where I even thought of sort of becoming a philosophy academic. But I, I sort of took the view that when you really look at philosophy, it's a very rarefied sort of subject, right? <laughs> there's, there's probably only about 20 or 30 philosophers or or, or great rabbinic thinkers who, who've ever said anything vaguely original <laughs> in the history of the world. And, right. And, and I reckoned that I probably wasn't quite clever enough to be one of those. <laughs> so, so I thought, you know, what am I going to do with this training? Well, you know, I'll go into finance, right? You know, every Jewish boy goes into finance, right? So, 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 so that's what I went and did. And, and I spent my uh, uh, career uh, working for various investment banks in London, New York. Um, you know, but but I was always, and so that's how I got in into the business. Um, it was really a training in, in both economics and and philosophy, and I say I worked um, uh, in investment banking. But it, it, I personally always had these sort of philosophical hankerings, and as I say, the the book is is really it's not just economics. It tries to combine philosophy with economics. It tries to combine it in a fun and slightly absurd way with these with these slightly uh, funky stories, which hopefully are are um actually uh, accessible to to you know the general reader so so that was my background all right and again uh people can get the book uh dinosaurdoritos.com a few minutes we have left through jeremy what would be your goal of people reading this book because as you mentioned it's a lot of stories to get people's mind to kind of expand think about finance but do you have a particular goal for the reader to get out of your book yeah, so look, I think there are a few things. First of all, um, first of all, it's the point I was making about socialism versus capitalism. You know, let, let's try and not be ideologues, okay, well, certainly when it comes to economics. It's a complicated business, and let's judge issues on their merits. Uh, you know, so, sometimes left-wing policies in economics seem to work, or more left-wing, sometimes more capitalistic policies seem to work. And that is definitely one of my messages of the book. Let's try and get a balance. Don't be ideological judge issues on their merits. That's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, don't take finance too seriously. I mean, you know, you know finance, one of the paradoxes of finance is that, you know, in one sense, and I say this in, in right, right in, in the beginning of the book, is, is um, in, it suffers from these existential crises where most financiers say, you know, what the hell is the, is the point of all of this, right? I mean, it's, it, it can be a very venal activity. And, it, and and you know that that's true of a lot of things in life, but 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 I think it's particularly true of finance, and it's particularly true of finance because finance isn't really dealing with the the real economy. All right, and the website again, dinosaurderivatives.com. Is that the best for, what, best way for people to pick up the book? Yeah, www.dinosaurderivatives.com, or you can just um, put it in dinosaurderivatives. There's the Wiley, there's the Wiley site, Wiley or the publisher, or you can get it on Amazon or Google. My name, Jeremy Joss, J O S S E. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much for being on the program. Of course, thank you, everyone, for listening. Again, this is Is a Prophecy on Israel National Radio, Ruth Sheva, and the show is syndicated as Messiah Hour on YouTube. Go to YouTube, type in Messiah Hour with Ari Lewis, subscribe to the YouTube channel. It is free to do so. And if you have any questions or comments, concerns, any show topics you want me to talk about in the future, any guests you want me to interview, email me, messiahhourgmail.com. We'll try to make that happen. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Have a great day. Be well. Thanks a lot.